Yeah, can you put a link on Blackboard to the submission site? Uh, to the submission site? Yes. Uh, sure. Send me an email and I'll do it. All right. Because otherwise I'll forget. Any other questions? All right. So bytes are coming into our lexer. And so the key question we're going to be setting here is how do we get from just a string of characters to program execution? Right? So we first need to think about, okay, we don't want to deal with just bytes because those are too fine grained. We want to deal with things like instead of the characters I followed by the character if, we want to deal with an if token. Right? That's something more abstract. It's not the raw characters, it's something a little bit more abstract. And this is what a program can understand and compute on. So the output here, the goal, this is where we're going, is a series of tokens. So when you think lexical analysis, input bytes, output tokens, bang, that's it. So anything to do with lexing, you're going to be generating tokens. Okay. So, how do we know what the valid syntax is for English? So we talked about it a little bit, right? What do we have in English that tells us when things are right or not right? Grammar. Is it coming here? Yeah. Grammar. Grammar. What about the grammar? Uh, just the just the way it's formatted using the 
the alphabet that you could use it? The way it's formatted using the alphabet? Yeah. What's lower than grammar? So grammar kind of to me defines what's a valid sentence. So or less. there is English syntax, but it's natural language syntax, so it's not as <coughs> formal as. Right, but thinking about it at high level, so we have the grammar which defines kind of how sentences look. Mm -hmm. What else do we have there? We have a 26 character alphabet. Though. Yes, we have an alphabet, right? We have, you can't just draw whatever you want and say, is this English or not? Right, you can't make up your own letters. That would make things insane, right? Although maybe, I guess now we're doing that with emojis, but that's a whole issue uh, I don't want to get into. Um, but yeah, so at the basic level, we need to say, OK, what are the characters? What's the, the raw you know, things? What are we going to use to communicate? Right? So in English, we have the alphabet plus numbers and maybe actually some other symbols. We actually have other things. So what are some other things that aren't in the alphabet and aren't 0 through 9? Punctuation, what kind of punctuation? Uh, period, period, point, ellipses. Let somebody else go. <laughs> it's a group thing. Periods, ellipses, exclamation points, question marks. Question marks. What was that? Semicolons. Semicolons, dashes, like long dashes. Or different. Actually, there's three different kinds of dashes if you've never looked that up before. It blew my mind the first time I learned that. Yeah, all kinds of stuff, right? And this all encompasses the alphabet, so when you see something, you can say, yes, that is English. Or no, that's not English because it has an N-Y in it, and that's not in the English language. Unless you're writing something that's like English-Spanish thing, whatever, but then you have other things, right? So we have all these characters that compose the alphabet, and we have a higher abstraction from that, right? So do we just, when you read this sentence, like think about it, this is a little meta, right? When you're reading this sentence in the slide, are you reading it character by character? Are you doing H-O-W-E-V-E-R, uh, uh, comma, wow, I forgot what that's called. Uh, comma, right? And then you go, aha, the word however. And then you go, W-E is we. So how do you know these differences between words? Spaces, right? So that can be even considered another character in our language is a space. And those spaces, so if you were to, you know, kind of abstract this, it would be maybe like word, comma, word, 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 no period at that. Right? But you know that they're abstract words. And of course, we can break down words into different types, right? We can have some words are nouns, some words are verbs. Some words are adjectives, some words are other things that I've forgotten from my English class, so I'm not going to try to go into. Right? But we have this higher abstraction to think about English, right? And we know words are valid because they're defined in a dictionary. Right? Or we know some words are valid because we know the other person will kind of know what we mean, even if we use it a little bit weird. And words, we've categorized words, there's different types of words. And so sentences, right? So we group sentences, so how do you know when a sentence ends and another one begins? Punctuation, yeah, a token, right? A period that says, hey, I'm, this is one finished sentence, I'm starting another sentence. And those can even be grouped up into paragraphs. How do we, know, how do we separate paragraphs? New lines and or indents, depending on the formatting. That actually can be kind of difficult. Um, I guess, well, these are good things to think about when you send emails to people like professors, if you just send a huge block of text as opposed to several paragraphs of text that are easy to digest. That's always good. Right? Cool. So we have this structure in English, right? And so in a programming language with syntax, we have the same thing, right? We have an alphabet. We have the set of possible bytes that make sense in our language, right? So maybe not every byte is valid in every C program. Right? Can you use a smiley face emoji in C? I seriously hope not. And hopefully nobody goes and finds out. If somebody wants to try compiling something right now and let us know, that would be kind of cool. Actually, Wait, man, I don't, there aren't emojis in UTF-A. Uh, there are, but I don't think C uses UTF-8. Yeah, it's, it's still used to ASCII. Yeah, but you can do it in like Python or other languages. Um, I had a professor who did everything in Scala, and 
that was kind of cool because he was doing math stuff, and so you could have like Unicode characters, so you could have like the actual arrow character and like union operators and delta symbols and all that stuff. It was like horrible to write, but it looked so pretty when you're done because it matched up exactly what the math looked like. Um, right, but this is a decision, and this is the other thing I want us to think about. Right? So we're studying syntax, we're understanding how to do this, but I want you to understand that the people that wrote the C programming language, right, they made decisions about what's going to be in the alphabet of that language. They made decisions about what does it mean to be a word, in that sense, or what does it mean to be a sentence, right? And those decisions affect you, but ultimately they're just engineering trade-off decisions. Right? So in C we have this actually, you know, a little bit, well, I don't know if it's slightly bigger than English, but there are a lot of characters in here, right, that we have to use. And maybe you've gotten used to figuring out where they all are on your keyboard, right, on that row on top. And so, just like we saw in English, the abstraction of words, right, we don't want to deal with characters, we want to deal with words. We want to deal with tokens. And so that's where the idea of token comes in. For instance, in C, or a C-like language, what does two equal signs next to each other mean? What is it? It's a quality token, right? It's not two equal signs, it means something more. It's a specific token, right? And maybe somebody has made the error that I've made in a while statement instead of uh, using two equal signs to compare things, you accidentally only use one equal sign and then you're assigning value instead of testing equality. So one character difference means huge semantic difference for your program. It does something completely wrong. And you're pulling out your hair because it runs and you don't understand what's going on. Right? Maybe it's just me, the only person that's done that. Cool, let's talk at the end of class, or at the end of the semester, see how that goes. Okay, the angle, left angle bracket and the equal sign, what token is that? Yeah, less than or equal, right? Semantically to us, it means one thing, even though it's two separate characters, right? While, the character's W-H-I-L-E. Yeah, while token, it's a, it's a reserved keyword. Can you have a variable called while in C or C++? No. No. It's kind of, can be annoying sometimes. Well, maybe not while, but maybe there's other things, right? But this is because those five characters next to each other, W-H-I-L-E, are special. They mean something special, right? They're an abstraction. They're a specific token themselves. Cool. If, just the same thing, an if token, right? And what we need to do, and really what we're studying here in lexical analysis, is how do we precisely specify these tokens? So how we're going to do this is using patterns. So uh, how many people have taken 355? How many people are currently taking? Cool. Wow. All right. Look around. You should form a support group or something. Um, but so there'll be a little bit of overlap here because we're covering the same concept. But you're going to go in much more detail over there. So the idea is, so we have our alphabet. What's inside the alphabet? Characters, yeah, individual bytes, characters, right? But we compose, if we concatenate characters together, we get what we're going to call a string, right? Seems kind of silly, why would we need to define that, right? We've been talking about strings your entire programming career, up in, in your education up until now. But we need to have precise definitions because we're going to talk about things like strings. So concatenating alphabet symbols together makes a string. And what we're going to do so we're going to get a little bit more formal now because we're going to start actually defining what do we mean by alphabet, what do we mean by string. So we're going to use the sigma, capital sigma, for the alphabet. And so we're going to say, so sigma is a finite set. So what does it mean to be a finite set? It terminates at some point. It, and it's countable. Yes, OK, yes. So a finite set means that there is a countable you can count, you know exactly how many elements there are in sigma, right? So for a given programming language, if I say the language is just the characters A and B, then all programs written in that language can only have the characters A and B. 
which is very similar to what? Binary, binary right? Binary is ones and zeros. Just using A's and B's is basically the same thing, right? So we're going to define a string. A string is a sequence of symbols from sigma. And we're going to have some special characters. So this is something we're going to use throughout the course. These things are important. So we're going to use epsilon is the empty string. Wait, is that, that is epsilon, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, I'm not Greek, so. Uh, epsilon is the empty string. OK, so yes. So this means an empty sequence of symbols. right? This means no symbols. So we have some rules that fall out from this. So if we concatenate epsilon with a, some string s, the result is just s, right? Because epsilon is empty. So if epsilon concatenated with epsilon, what do I get? Epsilon. epsilon. Cool. And this is just a different way of writing that. So we're going to use concatenation here just as the strings next to each other. So epsilon concatenated with s is the same as s concatenated with epsilon, which is the same as just s. So I'm going to try to do this. I can't guarantee that it happens all the time because, as we've seen, mistakes happen. So I'm going to try to stylize strings differently. So they'll either be inside double quotes or they'll be italic and dark blue. And this will distinguish between strings, which are sequences of symbols in our language, from other things. Cool? Questions? Okay, so a string is simply just a sequence of characters, and each character is from a specific alphabet, a given alphabet, one alphabet. So then what do we mean by language? I can we define that a little bit more precisely? What was that? It's a set of strings. Just a random set of strings? Yeah, so some a set of strings that are all valid programs in our language. We can think of like that, right? So this would be the set of every possible string that's valid in our language. Right? So if sigma is the set of all symbols in our alphabet, right? And sigma star is the set of all strings in sigma. So what does this mean when we use, in the kind of mathematical notation, when we use sigma star? So what does it mean the set of all strings over sigma? It can't repeat. What was that? It can't repeat. Yeah, it can repeat. So it's every possible combination of strings that can be made using all the characters from sigma. So for instance, let me flip over here. Hey, it's all working. Isn't that weird? At least for now. Cool. OK, so if we have sigma, as we said, if sigma is the symbol A and the symbol B, then sigma star will contain what? What about epsilon? Yeah? By using none of the strings in here, we get epsilon? The singleton set of A, the singleton set of B, and AB. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, this is, wait, you're talking about sets, though. Uh, it's sets, but we say we, we're concatenating, so it's strings. So oh, a set okay. of all strings. Oh. Yeah, so it's every possible yeah. order matters here, right? Okay. So it's not, we're not talking about sets, we're talking about strings. So yeah, we'll have a, a, we'll also have a, a, a. If I just sat up here and kept doing this, am I ever going to stop? No. So what does that tell you about... Sigma star. It is not a uh, program on It's not, well, it's, it's an infinite, it's not a finite set, right? It's an infinite set, it's never going to finish. But if I gave you a string and I said, is this string in sigma star, would you be able to answer that question? Yes. 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 All right, so if I said ACA, -A, is that in, no. is that an element of sigma star? No, no it is not. Exactly. Cool. Okay, so we already looked at this. Sigma star contains all strings that can be created by combining the alphabet symbols into a string. So, <laughs> sigma star defines every possible 
string that can ever be made. So if you think about like, an in, like a bunch of monkeys in front of a keyboard that only has the characters that are in sigma, every possible thing that those infinite number of monkeys can write, all those strings are going to be in sigma. Sigma star. So we're going to find a language. So a language is going to be a subset of sigma star, right? So we're going to say from all possible, sigma star is all possible strings you could ever write in this language. We're going to, oh, sorry, with this alphabet, L is going to be just those strings that are valid programs, or that are valid according to this language. So where is that? Is sigma infinite? No, right? We already really defined it as a finite set. Sigma star? Yes. Yeah, we're saying Is L infinite? No. No. Somebody argue yes or no? Yeah, man? Classes? Yeah. So, wait, are we arguing yes or no? Is infinite? So yes? Maybe you want to take the no side? Yeah. I was gonna just gonna say epsilon star is a subset of epsilon star. That's so, an infinite set. So therefore it's infinite. Ah, okay, so I'm gonna take the other side. You're gonna take the other side? Right. Yeah, so I think it's fine because uh, this is actually running into one of the problems with naive set theory right now. Just like just like I'm finished. I think it's fine because uh you, it, it needs to be valid, and it, uh, it's infinitely valid, and then you can't really define it as a language. Yeah. So if if L is indefinitely large, we wouldn't be able to decide whether or not a particular string is in the language or not until we've compared it against all the strings that are in L, which would take in no, the No, but the axiom seems like, like, like you. But. So, but we already said we can tell easily, we can decide if a string is in sigma star, and sigma star is infinite, right? Well, so I don't know, I think you said that, I don't know if we decided that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So if, if we're taking your word for it, then whatever. That's easily cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's pretty, the algorithm is pretty easy, right? You look at every character, any character in the string, if every character in the string is in sigma, then that string is going to be in sigma star. Because sigma star is all possible combinations of all characters in sigma. I think that's the only test, but that's just off the top of my head. But that's not, you know, we're not defining things that, right? But part of the thing is, so we just, all we have here is L is a subset of sigma star, right? So who's defining L? We are. We are, right? The programming language designer is defining L. So really, the answer is it depends, right? It depends on what L you're talking about and what rules there are for defining L. Could you write a programming language like that has the caveat that, let's say, I don't know, the maximum character size is 140 bytes? Yes. Yeah, you could write that language. Would L be finite or infinite in that case? Finite. Finite, because you can enumerate all, you know, every possible combination of letters in your alphabet that are in L are going to be in there. Are most programming languages like this? No, right? You can always, and you can think of it this easily, right? You can always add a new line of code to your program, right? It may not even affect things. You can just keep adding lines of code. Now, there may actually be practical limitations. That I don't know what the limitations are of compilers and what size of input files they'll accept. Uh, that would be kind of interesting, something interesting to explore. And so really, I, there's no hard or fast answers here. Really, both ways are correct, but I want you to think about both ways, right? Because we are defining L, and that's why the answer is, well, my answer is it depends. Cool. OK. So the way we are going to precisely define the strings that are in L is through regular expressions. So regular expressions are going to help us precisely define exactly what we mean when we talk about um, when we talk about what strings are in a language L. So, anybody use regular expressions before in a job? Uh, somebody who's raising their hand want to tell us what they use it for? 
Yeah. Yeah, so like to validate or check that mid user input is valid against the date. Yeah. What like sorry, sorry, what language? Uh BB Ooh, BB.net, nice. Parsing through Ooh, parsing through and trying to extract information from a large body of text. What uh, language? JavaScript. JavaScript? Anybody have anything else in a different language? Yeah. Validating email addresses in Rails. Ooh, validating email addresses in Rails. Keep that in mind, we're gonna get to that. I'm gonna show you why that's a bad idea later. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so the point of this is to talk about that we're not just learning esoteric regular expressions and regular languages and all this because we like to think about theory things, which we do because we're computer scientists, but these are actually things that people use every day in their jobs, right? Regular expressions come up very frequently. So this is one of those beautiful cases where theory meets practice in something that you use all the time. So this is an area I urge you to spend time, get familiar with regular expressions, because they're going to come up and they're gonna come up a lot. Okay, so tokens, the tokens of a language are typically specified using regular expressions. So that's why we're studying them now in this class. They also have really interesting theoretical components, but for this class, it's a much more practical manner. We need a way of precisely identifying what do we mean by a token. So, so some people that have used regular expressions, uh, especially in a job setting, what did you, what were they good for? Why did you use them? Because your boss told you to? Yeah? They're easy to create rules or validation Yeah, so they're kind of easy to create rules or validation, so kind of deciding how things match, talking about the matching thing. What was your, what did you, did you like it? Follow up? Did you like using it? Yeah, so yeah. It's a lazy way to get something that appears to be working rather quickly. <laughs> I think you could levy that argument against a lot of programming languages and frameworks. Uh, yeah, it's a lazy way to get something that kind of appears to work but really doesn't, yeah. It's sort of a language in itself. Yeah, so you have to learn essentially a new language in addition to the language that you're already using. And we move from like Perl regular expressions to JavaScript regular expressions to maybe VB.net regular expressions. They may all have slightly different syntax for what you're used to, so then things can change that way. What are some of the pros? So we talked about some of the cons. What are some of the good things? Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually like, as we'll see, we can describe an infinite, a super large, you know, an it, I guess I shouldn't say super large, but we can describe an infinite set of strings using you know, four or five characters. Right? As long as people know how to interpret that regular expression, you can express very complicated things in a short amount of characters. Uh, definitely. So you know, they're compact. They're expressive. We'll kind of see just a little bit of where the bounds are on this expressiveness. Uh, they're precise, right? I can show you a regular expression, and as long as we're talking about the exact same regular expression language, you should be able to know exactly what strings match that and are in that language and what strings are outside that language. Widely used, I think hopefully some of your fellow students have convinced you that people actually do use these. And we're not going to get into it, but they're actually incredibly efficient. So especially the ones we're going to talk about here. Uh, but it's easy in some sense, in some sense it's easy, to generate an efficient program to match a regular expression. So this is often why it's used in programming and in real world projects. Cool. Okay. Now, so somebody posted on the email list about VM inception. Now we're kind of in syntax inception. So I told you we need to talk about syntax, right? We're going to learn regular expressions so we can define the syntax of a language. But regular expressions themselves are a language, so we need to define the syntax of regular expressions in order to talk about regular expressions to talk about syntax of languages, right? So we've <coughs> found ourselves in a loop. Okay, so we're going to do it kind of informally. That's, that's the way we get around this. Um, so we're going to say that a regular expression is either an empty string, so here we're using this as an empty string, 
epsilon. So empty string would be no regular expression. The empty string would be, so now remember, it's okay, it's just like, and, all right. I'm gonna do it by hand because it's easier. Okay, so we need to find things that are regular expressions, right? So we need to find the syntax of a regular expression. So a regular expression is either going to be one of these things. It's either going to be the empty set, which we'll talk about semantically what that means. It's going to be epsilon. It is going to be, I can cheat a little bit. OK, good. Make sure I get the syntax right. OK, cool. A, where A is an element of sigma. Right? So this would be A is some symbol in our language. Right? So all symbols in our language are valid regular expressions. Cool. We have R1 bar R2, where R1 and R2 are regular expressions. So what kind of definition is this? Recursive. Yes, recursive definition, right? Cool. Okay, so this means that bar is a special character essentially in our regular expression language, right? This means something. We'll talk about exactly what it means in a second. Uh, the other thing I guess I should note is, especially in your academic career, people use syntax differently. So we're going to follow the syntax that I think is closely related to real programming languages. Um, so, you know, if you see if it's slightly different, you're going to have to deal and learn the different things. Because this is why we're precisely defining exactly what it means. Okay, there we go. Uh, R1 dot R2, where R1 and R2 are regular expressions. So the dot character is a special character. Bracket R. Uh, left, I should say left, uh, left parenthesis, R, right parenthesis, where R is a regular expression. Cool. R star. Where R is a regular expression. And that's it. No more. Okay. So if I were to ask you a question like, is this, oh, yes. Uh, what is the difference between our, our first two options here, the empty set and the empty string? We'll talk about that eventually. So right now, I just wanted to define what regular expressions look like. So we have to define that first, and then we have to define what do all of these things actually mean. Just like what we're going to do is talk about syntax, and then we talk about semantics, right? So how does a program look versus what does a program mean? And so we have to do the same thing here. So I want to first build up. So that way, everyone knows when I show you something, this is a regular expression. So to do that, if I give you some string and I say, is this a regular expression, what do you need to know in order to make that determination? I give you the string. I say, is this a regular expression? Can you say yes or no? Yes? Is it part of alphabet? Yeah. Do you have a defined alphabet in this example? Yes. That, we need the alphabet. Why do we need the alphabet? Check case three. To check case, yeah. So I didn't number them, but. Right? Yeah. Case three, right? We need to know what is the alphabet. Exactly. So if I said here the alphabet is the set containing A and the set containing B, then is this a valid regular expression? No. Yes. No? It contains a symbol. What's that dot in between A and B? Oh, sorry. Yes. So yes. But if the language is only A, then it's not, because we have some B that's not in our language, and it's not one of our special regular expression symbols. 
So the only regular expression symbols, we have the bar, and I'll, I'll show you on here, obviously it looks a little bit better here. The bar, the dot, so the dot can either be a period or an actual dot in the middle. It's just a little annoying to do that on the slides. Um, it could be parentheses or it could be the star. Questions on that? Yeah? What if the dot is in the encrypted system? Then we got problems. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it would be fine. You would just have to, I mean, these are, so these, the bar, the dot, parentheses, the star, right? These are all arbitrary characters. Are those operators on regular expressions? And are they going to be defined at some point? Yes, we're going to define the semantics of these later. Okay. We're talking about the syntax right now. So yeah. Um, wait, what was the question? I lost my train Ah, yeah, we'll talk about that when we get a little bit to semantics. We have to have some way of dealing with that, but it's not too important. It is important because how you know how would you write a regular expression that matches the bar character, right? Vertical bar. You need some way of doing that, right? So uh, we'll see a little bit later how we do that. But now I want to do some things like ask some questions. Uh, okay, so we said this. So let's use just the language. Uh, the alphabet is just A and B, and so we said, okay, the string A dot B is that in the, is that a regular expression? Yes. Yes. Cool. What about A bar B? Yes. yes. What about A bar bar B? Uh, yes. 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 No. Yes. No. Yes. no? Yes. Oh, brains. Okay. So let's actually step back a little bit. So why did we know that this one is a regular expression? Which of these rules first applies? Rule four. And then rule four only applies if what? If A is a valid regular expression and R and B is a valid regular expression. Are A and B regular valid regular expressions? Yes. Yes, both by rule three. Right? Okay. So now let's look here. And we say, okay, is so we're going with this. A bar bar B. So which rule would apply there? So first four. Four. So we have, but which is R1 and which one is R2? Yeah. A and the empty and the empty set. Uh, A bar. No. A bar and then A bar. Right, so this means that we have to be able to deconstruct this into an R1 and an R2 and a bar. So let's say we can say R1 is what, A bar? And R2 is what, B? Yeah? So is R2, is this a regular expression? Yes. Is this a regular expression? No. Yes. Well, yes. It's A bar, so it would be. Yeah. So it's like. It's like, guys, let's. Would, would R1 actually be A, a bar epsilon? Where's the epsilon? Well, it's, it's, it's empty, right? So, is there an epsilon in here? No, it's one. <clears throat> right? Is there an epsilon in this original string? Uh, no. So no. Technically, no. Technically, <laughs> there is none. <laughs> right? We're just talking about just the characters that are in this string. Right? So, you're saying a regular expression is either an empty set, which I kind of want to get rid of. It's not very important right now. Epsilon, right? So let's think about it this way. Is this a valid regular expression? Yes. yes? By which rule? Two. 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 Great. Is this a valid regular expression? Yes. yes. Why? Two. Rule four first. 
And so what's R1 in this case? Epsilon. Epsilon. And what's R2? B. Exactly. And so is epsilon, epsilon a regular expression based on what? Two. And then B is also by three. So this is valid. So let's go back to here. Is this a valid regular expression? No. Because there's nothing here. But isn't nothing the empty set or? No. Okay. That's why I kind of want to get rid of it, but. Right, we just have to deal with the characters that are here, right? Think of it another way. Well, based on what we have here, is this a valid regular expression? Yes. Yes? So which one of these rules would apply, let's say? Five. Five? Is there a dot in there? No. No. Three? No. Seven? Is there a star in there? No. Yes. There's a star in here? But did you say like the star is all the set? Ah, you're putting your you're putting your knowledge of what it is and your semantics onto it. Yeah, we don't have any semantics. Exactly. Just based on looking at these rules, right? We would need a star character for rule seven to appear. We need parentheses for rule six to uh, apply. We need a dot character for rule five to apply. We need a bar for rule four to apply. So which rule would apply? Three. Three. Yeah, three. So is so what's a in this case? A B is A B in our language? What's in our language? A and B. Is A B in our language? No. No. Is this fun? Okay, so we came back. This is not in the language. So what about this? Uh, a or B. I'm oh, sorry. A bar B. Semantics of all these things later. It looks like next class. 
So I have a question. Yes. What is, is, is the null character the empty set or like that, like semantically? Uh, it would be literally an empty set. So instead of saying like the string containing epsilon, this is the difference between the null character and the string containing epsilon. So it does have, I think it will have some semantic differences, but not a ton. Cool. All right. Pick back up on this on the Friday. Friday.